Welcome to Second Table, where we discuss spirituality, philosophy, and psychology. I'm your host, Winston Janice. Once again, welcome to Second Table, everyone. Today I'm joined with Paul Knitter, who is the Emeritus Paul Tillich Professor of Theology, World Religions, and Culture at Union Theological Seminary. He's a former Catholic priest and the author of many books, his most recent entitled, Without Buddha, I Could Not Be a Christian. Thank you so much for joining us today, Paul. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Winston. Yes. Um, I, uh, I was, we were speaking um, through email before we got a chance to do this, um, that your book uh, had a significant impact on me because part of my journey has been um, having been born and raised Christian, but also having been influenced by the Buddhist tradition and having sort of an identity struggle and struggle wrestling with my faith. So to discover that someone as yourself has written such a book um, was very exciting for me to come upon that book and to help me um, to try to reconcile and see how these two different, very different faith traditions could be integrated. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to share with our listeners uh, a lot of your ideas. And um, I think, as I mentioned to you, I was in seminary uh, at Boston University and I um, got a chance to do an independent study. And I ended up doing an independent study that was entitled um, The Theological Coherence of Dual Religious Belonging. Um, oh, and, mm -hmm. and it focused heavily on your book um, as an example of how we could, uh, how could it be coherent for us to... Um, uh, be have dual religious belonging with the Christian and Buddhist traditions. So, so it was a lot of fun to go through your book and write that paper, um, and now to be uh, here sitting with you. And um, and now I'm continuing my journey uh, to becoming uh, on the verge of getting ordained as a United uh, pastor in the United Church of Christ. Oh, so, wonderful! Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm on my job search right now, searching for a call. Good but for uh, you. Good yeah, for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So. Um, gosh, I mean, there's so many places we can talk about these things and discuss these things, but I guess uh, part of the reason, as I've said to uh, here before on other episodes, my intention with doing this podcast is to offer an alternative voice to the dominant and popular Christian voices. Um, and many of those, for so many people, I think Christianity is this uh, conceptualized as an exclusive religion. Mm -hmm. That to suggest that you can uh, fundamentally agree with Buddhist teachings to affirm Buddhism while simultaneously having a Christian identity, I think to a lot of people is almost unthinkable and very strange still. Um, yeah. So I, I, I guess to start off, you know, do you often talk with people who come from that sort of perspective? I'd be curious to hear what you tell them. Um, I guess in, in other words, it's uh, what's sort of the elevator speech for uh, the content of your book, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll see. I'll make it. Hope I make the elevator uh, speech a short ride. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you know, just just a, a, a introductory, a general comment. Um, if Jesus of Nazareth is really what Christians believe he is and have experienced him to be, namely uh, someone who, whom they would, would call the Son of God and in, insofar as he really um, spoke the truth about ultimate reality about God. Um, and if the Buddhists are correct in their discovery that this um, Gautama, who came to be called the Buddha, really did reach enlightenment, and so he preached a message of truth about enlightenment. If both of them are speaking the truth in their very different cultural contexts, historical periods, of course, 
But if in general, this is a more philosophical question, which I wonder if it makes sense to you, but if, if both of them really have messages that are true, then even though those messages will be different, as you would expect them to be, um, Jesus having been born you know, in, in, in what is today Israel-Palestine, Buddha having been born in what is today Nepal at very different periods, historical t periods, they would be different. But if they're both true, then they can't be contradictory. Mm. Truth is universal. What is true is true for everyone. And so even though they may look different, maybe we should approach them with the, with the hope, with the, even the expectation that they're, if they're both speaking the truth, those truths will be complementary to each other. They won't be contradictory. Mm -hmm. um, that's, just, that's just kind of a, of a philosophical uh, uh, reflection on it. I don't know, does that make sense to you? Yes. Um, I mean, for me, you know, having read your book, um, it reminds me of the parts where you, you were talking a lot about the finger pointing to the moon, um, which is a Zen saying... Um, yeah. that uh, the finger pointing to the moon is not the moon, but also pointing out that um, so that there are Buddhist fingers, right? And there are Christian yeah. fingers and that a Buddhist might be pointing to the moon, to certain parts of the moon and describing those parts. Yeah. But a mm -hmm. Christian might be pointing to different parts of that same moon and and pointing out so that they both mutually benefit from one another to dis descri describe the landscape, essentially. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so, no. so I think having read that, um, and that, that helps me make sense of, I think, what you said. Yeah. Um, and, and then on top of that, for me personally now, now I'll speak a little bit more personally, uh, after having made a philosophical comment, um, as you mentioned, Winston, I mean, I was uh, a Catholic priest. I had the, the, one of the greatest blessings of my life that in the last four years of my seminary preparation for the Catholic priesthood, um, now this is back in 1962, mm. um, <laughs> long before you were around, um, um, I, mean, I was sent for the last four years of my theological studies to Rome. To study at the um, at least in Catholic circles, the fairly well known Gregorian Pontifical University, um, and, and but and that was a, a, a wonderful opportunity in itself. But even a greater opportunity, which I didn't realize until I got there, was that I arrived in Rome on on the end of September 1962. About two weeks later, the Second Vatican Council started. Mm, and nice. I was standing in Piazza San Pietro in St. Peter's Square um, with my little box camera to take a picture of the then Pope, Pope John XXIII, at the head of a procession of over 2,000 bishops as they marched into St. Peter's uh, Basilica to begin what the Second Vatican Council. Wow. And lots said about that. But, so I was in Rome for the whole for the whole council period. And we had, I was, I don't want to get into too many details here, but I was i was living in a in a house of studies, um, a collegio as they were called, where we had about, and I was a part of a religious order, the Society of the Divine Word. And the, the Society of the Divine Word had missionary bishops all over the world who were in Rome attending the council. So we had 24 bishops who every day would go to the St. Peter's for the council, and we would go to the university for our classes, and then come back and, and talk with the bishops. Anyway, I'm getting to my point, is that I still remember when one of the bishops, a uh, bishop from India, um, Bishop Simon, I still remember his name, showed me the first draft of a, what is called a, a declaration of the Catholic Church's attitude towards other religions. Mm -hmm. And I could not believe my eyes, because the Catholic Church is not known for its progressivism and, 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 and ability to change or to admit mistakes. Right. But there in that, in that declaration, it's called the Declaration on, on, on the Church's Attitude Towards Other Religions. Its Latin title is Nostra Aetate, 
Mm. In that declaration, it said that that we have to, we Christians have to be have to recognize that God is present in other religions. Mm-hmm. God is doing good in other. There is truth and value, and wisdom in other religions. And on top of it, they added, and Christians. They were speaking especially to Catholic Christians. And I think it might be a message for all Christians, and that Christian Catholics are called upon to enter into, the Latin word is colloquium. It sounds like a, 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 a colloquy, but that's translated dialogue, into a dialogue with people of other religions, mm. so that they come to appreciate the truth that they have. That, for me, was in, inspired my whole life as a priest, my, then subsequently my life as a theologian. And, 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 I, and so that, that's another reason why I would say, yes, definitely Christians can learn something from Buddhists, and Buddhists, of course, can learn something from Christians. Mm-hmm. But my, my final and even more personal reason why I, would, I felt I can learn from, from, from Buddhists, and in, in fact, I, I hope I have, I think I have, but even more personal reason is, well, it's, it's my... It's who Jesus Christ is for me. Mm-hmm. In my own relationship with Jesus, um, Jesus the Christ, um, in my own experience of him reading the Gospels, reading the New Testament, celebrating the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, um, my own life in Christ, I have come, and I'm, it's not just me, but I have come to experience Jesus. In, and I'll, in, this is in the words of, of, a, of a theologian friend of mine, who is even a little bit older than I am, um, John Cobb, he said, to know Jesus is to realize that Jesus is the way that is open to other ways. Jesus is the way that is open to other ways. Um, so that to know Christ is to recognize that, the, that, that we are called to be open, to respect, to enter into respectful open-minded, open-hearted conversation with others. Um, and, and so it is really, my inspiration for dialogue comes from, primarily from my own Christian faith, or at least from my own understanding, and if I may dare say, my own experience of the risen Christ. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like um, that there's something in the nature of love that is uh, yeah. an openness and a recept- yes. receptivity. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, openness of love means where there are differences, we will recognize those differences. Or if I, if I see something that another person, whom as a Christian, as a fellow human being, I love, but who I think is doing, going about destructive behavior or, or preaching harmful a message, I will, I will disagree and I will oppose but it will always be out of love. Always. Mm. Mm. Very Not good. I think he's a jerk, but because I love him. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, no, I think it's a good answer. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and, and this kind of goes tying back into, um, you know, use this analogy. And I think it gets into why you titled the book Without Buddha, I could not be a Christian. Um, uh, you know, I've talked. I've talked about this, and I don't know if you mentioned it or not. But the idea that it's like when you study abroad. Um, I've used this analogy. Um, it gives you a greater appreciation for an understanding of the context of your own home. Yes. When you mm-hmm. travel in other places and experience yeah. life, how it's done in other ways. And um, it does seem to me like I would recommend to people that they should um, explore other faith traditions in order to gain a, an even deeper understanding of their own context, their own religious heritage. And I think that is, is what you're getting at with, with uh, the title in your book. Was that what you just say that's true? Yeah, oh, I, th- I very much so. And I love your comparison of, you know, traveling to other countries, to other cultures, 
uh, when you come to uh, to realize or to appreciate your own. But part of the appreciation of your own culture, it seems to me, Winston, is that you realize the limits and the limitations of your own culture. In mm-hmm. other words, you discover that there's other ways to understand human human reality, other ways to respond to certain common questions. But you realize that, gee, I love my I love my culture, I love my country, I love America, but there are other ways of doing things mm. that are sometimes different where I would say, um, geez, no, I prefer my American way. <laughs> For breakfast, give me ham and eggs, not some of this mush that they serve in Japan. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but then you could see some of the the artwork in the in the Japanese culture, just using an example, and how that can enrich and and, and show ways of being of, of art and appreciating beauty in a Japanese rock garden, for instance. I mean, who you you know say, well, you don't find beauty in a rock garden, you know, and that is not that, that easily. But for them, that's one of their primary ways of discovering beauty. Your my culture has just been enhanced. My appreciation of beauty has just been enhanced by experiencing beauty in a Japanese rock garden. Mm. Mm. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's, uh, I think you're absolutely right. Um, because I find that to be true in my own experience that, um, my own, my own journey into Buddhism and studying Eastern religious traditions has been such a nice contrast that has helped me, you know, see my own tradition with Buddhist glasses on. Mm -hmm. Right. Um. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think there are ongoing tensions uh, in a way, and um, hopefully those can be creative tensions, right? But uh, and I think you you discuss a lot of this in your book, and um, it's hard to know even which direction to go with in in terms of um, what we can share with our listeners. But I think um, I think one of the areas might be uh, the issue of a personal God. And yeah. prayer is connected with that petitionary prayer, praying to God. Um, Buddhists, I think, have a sort of a reputation for maybe de-emphasizing a personal God. I don't think they're actually um, necessarily saying there is no. They're not a, saying definitively that there is no personal God, right? Um, mm-hmm. But there is this sort of uh, general maybe impression that people have that oh, Buddhists are essentially atheists. Um, and uh, Christians are obviously not, right? Um, I don't know if we want to get into that a little bit, if that makes sense, the issue of a personal God and and how that works with how that fits or doesn't fit with the Buddhist tradition, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, right, Winston. And and let just to kind of comment on this briefly, and please jump in with clarifying questions if 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 you feel the need to do so. But yes, I mean, um, well, I I think what Buddhist, what Buddhism has helped me on on the question of what do I mean or what am I experiencing when I say I believe in God? Um, and I th- for me, Buddhists have reminded me because they you're right they don't deny. God as a personal being, but they don't want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. They don't want to talk about it that much. You know, they, 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 they're, they're wary of, of, of talking too much about something that for them is fundamentally so mysterious, so beyond human comprehension. It's as real as it is mysterious for them. It's as, it's as real to their experience as it is beyond their rational understanding, their mind's understanding. Mm-hmm. And they stress that. And they stress that strongly. Now, we don't, Christians don't stress it as strongly, even though that is part of Christian teaching. Absolutely, yeah. By the, certainly by our mystics, but also I can give you, I don't have it at handy, but I can give you councils of the church that have said, that have said God is essentially mysterious and therefore incomprehensible. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Boy, do we forget that, we Christians. And this is where Buddhism has, has reminded me. We, and so it's really, now this, got, this is taking another step further, which, again, let me know how, how it sounds. But it's, it is saying that, therefore, all of our language about God, all of the words we use, all of the images that fill our Bible, um, all of these, to use your, your image that you quote, uh, referred to earlier, all of these are fingers pointing to the moon. They are not the moon. Right. Or to put that in a little bit of a different kind of more philosophical language, or, um, yes, philosophical language, that, that all of our language, all of our words are um, our poetry. Mm-hmm. They're, 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 they're symbols, they're metaphors, they're true symbols, they're true metaphors. When I say that they're symbols, that doesn't mean, oh, it's only a symbol. My, my, one of my, Paul Tillich, whose chair I had at Union, used to say, if you know what a symbol really is, and how a symbol can stir your own experience and communicate truth to you, if you realize what a symbol really is, you would never say it's only a symbol. You would say, darn it, it's a symbol. You, you know, anyway, so, but all of our language, all of our words are symbols. That means we have to be, we have to take them seriously, personally, with open hearts um, and open minds, but we have to be really careful about taking them literally. Because if we take them literally, they may lose the power to really touch us and communicate to us what they are intended to communicate. So that's what the Buddhists have reminded me of. Mm. That, that, that all of my language is, is necessary. Now, this is where, as a Christian, I might have a little criticism of the Buddhists when they say, oh, we don't need language. Some Buddhists might say, we don't need language. I'd say, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> you do as a Christian. But, yeah. but, but still, it's language is as, <laughs> if I may put it this way, dangerous as it is necessary when it's language about God. Mm. It, it can be dangerous even though it is necessary. And I think the key is to remember it's, it's, it's a finger pointing. It's a symbol that is meant to touch us, not to be taken literally. And therefore, not just to get, well, anyway, I, I, if you wanted to oh, throw go, in a question. Go ahead, here, finish up, yeah. yeah. But, but uh-huh. therefore, or not therefore, but further, um, Buddhists, and I, my practice of Buddhism is a, is a Tibetan, a form of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and Tibetan Buddhists, like the Dalai Lama, mm-hmm. um, um, and Tibetan Buddhists, you know, do use a, a good bit of language. And they do use images. Um, and they do speak about, about the depth of our being or the, the, the foundation for our lives. If I may use a term that Paul Tillich used, the ground of our being, the source of our being, that which is giving you life right now, giving me life, part of the intelligence that both of us are using as we talk to each other. That's, that's the mystery of the divine. That is the ground of being working in it. And the Buddhists stress that this ultimate reality is not a thing. In fact, they use the, the, the term, which for Christians uh, can be a little bit uh, um, unsettling, they, to refer to ultimate reality, to refer to the reality that we Christians refer to with our word G-O-D, God, they sometimes use the word no thing, mm-hmm. nothing. <laughs> Shem Yadah, right? Yeah, but, but, but in the sense of no thing. Or they'll use the word the, the Shunyata or emptiness. Right. That all the ultimate reality is empty. That doesn't mean it doesn't. It's empty of any kind of independent of substantial existence. It's it's not an it's not a thing. 
What is it then? It's a presence. It's a, now in my Tibetan tr tradition, my teacher uses the word, it's an energy, an energy of love. Um, and and, and it's, so therefore, it's not, now here, if this makes sense, and tell me if this makes sense to you. Therefore, I, I would suggest from what the Buddhists are telling me, the God, it, it telling us Christian, God is not a person. As you are a person, you know, as sitting in front of me or on my on my computer screen, um, you. I mean, it's not a person the way you and I are persons, or everyone, all the other human beings. But God is personal, mm -hmm. not a person, but personal. This, this, this energy, this presence, this dynamic source of life is a, re a, a, a reality that connects, that joins us, that calls us that, to, to love and to receive love. That's, that's the, 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 the reality that's going on. And, and the Buddhists don't have a neat word for it. Oh, yes, they, I just, they have some words for it. But when I try to, to, to put it into Christian language, you know what I find? I find that the two words, the two terms that were that are used in the New Testament, the, I think the only two terms that are used in the New Testament to fill to fulfill this simple three word sentence, God is. Now, what what words does the New Testament use to, to fill finish that sentence? God is. Love. Love, letters of, of John, or John's Gospel, and Jesus talks talking to I think it was to the Samaritan woman. You know, um, God is spirit, and and is to be worshipped in spirit. So, in other words, these two terms, spirit, love, those are words that I think a Buddhist, at least a Tibetan Buddhist, could be quite comfortable with. So it's it's so you see it's not it's not so much that God is an entity out there that we can talk to, but that God is in is a loving, creative spirit that permeates our spirit. That it is our spirit. Um, it just as that that how could, that we participate in the spirit of God. That, that's a better way of of of, of putting it. And so, so that, so that then, therefore, to experience God is to feel this, this assuring energy of love, this this presence that that affirms me in love, and that calls me to love others. What do you mean? Which others? All others. Buddhists even add, not just other human beings, but all sentient beings. We we are to love. Mm. That, um, so, in other words, it, it's, it, it becomes then a way of Buddhism has helped me. And Winston, I'm not saying that everybody needs Buddhism. No way would I ever say that. But for me and for a good number of others, people who have read my book and have told me um, that it, it has helped, but that, that, that Buddhism, Buddhism has helped me reappropriate, reappropriate, if I use that word, repossess or reinvigorate, if I may say, this Christian language about God as love and God as spirit. And it's kind of like another way of putting it, Buddhism has helped me recognize that God is, I have a little, I have a little uh, a rock on my, on my desk here next to me. It says, God is a verb, not a noun. <laughs> and I get at it too. Not a noun, a thing out there, but a dynamic and energetic presence that is that is giving life and 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 subsistence to the whole world. Yeah. Well. Well said. Well said. Um, I do love the idea of God as a connecting spirit, and um, there's other ways I think you've described that as well. Um, God is a connecting spirit or a personal presence of spirit. Yeah. Um, and I just, just to connect it more with the personal, because 
it's been sort of an ongoing thing for me because, of course, I was raised in the Christian tradition and, and originally thought of God as a very personal, a personality, a super being, right? Um, uh, and so I, um, I love these ideas. And I think, I think that, um, like we said, there's something that can be learned from the Christian approach, uh, approaching God. That um, and you indicated this in your book um, as as you were getting into the whole idea of a personal God versus the connecting spirit. Um, that what it means to be human is to be relational, and a lot of people make that point. That um, uh, like one of your quotes here, certainly it should be possible or necessary to have an interpersonal relationship with the divine, which requires God to be a you. Um, God contains what God has produced as the pinnacle Mm -hmm. of creation, personality. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, But as you also pointed out, uh, I think this was well said, a precondition for addressing God um, is a realization as a you is the realization that we shouldn't address yeah. address God as a you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, kind of pointing pointing to what you were saying that um, that uh, to to throw out another quote that you said here: all that can be known of God is by far surpassed and must be held in check by what is not and cannot be known of God. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I, I do I do think um, it's been a consistent struggle for me since I've been exposed to Eastern religious traditions to uh, sometimes want that um, feeling of intimacy as a human being uh, relating to the divine, and then at other times feeling like maybe that doesn't fit with Buddhism. But um, but I, I do a- agree with the points you're making. Um, it just it just still seemed to be a little bit of a struggle. I wonder if part of the struggle maybe perhaps is um the balance or the dance um walking the fine line between um sort of this idea that I think it's implied within in, both in your book and within the Buddhist tradition that um we are identified in some way with the absolute with the ultimate with God. God works in us, through us, as us, um, we're a team with God is one way I think you've put it, and um, and I think because our minds are almost inherently dualistic, and that yeah, on the one sense we um, we it's hard for us to hold both of those at the same time as as feeling as though there's something greater than us, greater than ourselves, bigger than ourselves that we can sort of surrender to and put our trust in. And, and, and this maybe gets at the heart of why a lot of, um, a lot of Christians maybe find this problematic, right? Because they want to believe that it's not them that are in control, right? Um, but there's some greater being that is in control and they can um, surrender to and pray to and that's, that's going to take care of things. Um, versus the idea that I feel like that you find within Buddhism, and I don't know if I've mentioned to you, I'm a big f- fan of Alan Watts, right? And and yeah. those ideas, it's kind of like, well, you are the universe experiencing itself. You are a wave in the ocean that is ultimately the ocean itself, and how that. Um, uh, so then that 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 brings the responsibility back to the individual in a way that. Okay, I am in some sense this co-creator or participant with God, and in some sense even identified with God, which I think a lot of Christians find scary and, and um, uh, kind of heretical, maybe right. But ironically, yeah. Yeah. that's what we find in Jesus, right? It's like Jesus symbolically, as a symbol, you could take is the union between exactly flesh and spirit and world and so exactly. I don't know, yeah, mm-hmm. and. And Buddhists would say that therefore what Jesus has what it, what Jesus was is what we are all called to be, sons and daughters of God, and aware and trusting of God as love, Jesus 
the love language for Jesus was Abba. He called the ultimate reality Abba, mm -hmm. Dad. Um, but, but that what he realized is what we are all called to realize. And few of us will achieve it the way Jesus did, but that's what we're called to do. Mm. Yeah. But, I, do, I, yeah, I wonder if it's part of our uh, reluctance uh, or our, our fear of this idea that, um, like I said, one way to express this is that we are the universe experiencing itself, waking up to our unity and interconnectedness with the entire universe. Um, maybe the fear of that is the, the sense of responsibility that it comes back to us because then we're realizing that in a, some, uh, maybe in some sense we're playing a larger role than we even think. Um, you know, it's easy to kind of displace that and put it onto uh, a God that is totally other. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, I, think I wonder that if that's part does. of it. That certainly does. But, but you know, while this understanding of God as, well, let me just use another text from the New Testament. I think it's Acts of the Apostles. Oh, I forget which chapter. I'm a Catholic. I don't know my Bible as well as uh, you. you <laughs> Bible. Um, but um, where, where Paul says, God is that in which we live and move and have our being. God is that in which we live so we're living in God. We live and move and have our being in God. I mean, that is, that's pretty close. That's kind of getting close to the, we, the universe, we are the universe being aware of itself. We are, um, so God is, is, if I may put it this kind of silly way, God is Godding in us. Right. God wants to be God in and through us. That can scare the bejeebies out of us, as you just said. Whoa, that's a bit of a load of responsibility. But wait a minute. We're not alone. <laughs> it is God that's working in us. We're not by ourselves. This is not a responsibility that that that, that we're bearing, you know, all by ourselves. Mm. It is it is see, and this is where this is where um you know to understand God as this personal presence or this energy um, really is an invitation to Christians to a different kind, or at least for some Christians, to a different kind and for and to a, maybe a deeper way of praying. Because in in this in this understanding of God, you don't. You're not called so much to talk to God because it's not, you know, it's it's not a God as an entity, as a person, stand, you know, out, outside of you, in front of you, but as a as a as a spirit, an all pervading spirit, a spirit of love, a spirit of affirmation, um, and so what you do is you just sit in the presence or with the presence. I like in the presence and so the, of God and and as as all forms of of meditation well, I shouldn't say all but many forms of meditation um, urge us, not just Buddhists, but also Christian forms of meditation. I'm thinking of centering prayer, for instance, mm -hmm. is to is to, the, the first, the essential step is to shut up. <laughs> stop, stop talking. Stop thinking. I mean, playing with your 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 your, your concepts, trying to get the right concept. Just shut up and see what happens. Put yourself in the presence. I like, but shut up, and you just might wake up. You know yeah. um, that that there is, and 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 this is forms of of of. To, again, Tibetan Buddhism, I don't know if this might be helpful, but let me just tell you what I did this morning together with my wife for our morning meditation. We, we, and this is a Tibetan form of meditation. So the first, the first phase of the meditation, we were instructed, and it's kind of like a guided meditation. We were guided to recall to mind someone in your life 
whom you feel really has loved you. Maybe throughout your life or maybe at a particular point in your life, recall that moment and feel that the love that that person had for you. And then they say, if you're having trouble finding a person, a dog, your dog will do. The dog <laughs> that you, who loves you. Look in any way. But, but feel the love. Feel it. That person is enabling you to feel your own value and beauty and dignity. They see it, even when you don't see it. So that's the first part of the meditation. I'm really abbreviating here, Winston. Sure. And then, and then we're instructed... Now, let the imaging go. Let the, the picturing go, the imagination. Let it all go and just sit in that love. Let that love hold you. What that person did for you, it, that person provided you an access point into the love is that is given to you in your very being, that is holding you in your very being, as it holds all of us as this spirit. So now let all thoughts go and just sit in in quiet meditation. If you want to, just then count, be aware of your breath if you want, if that helps, and just sit and abide in that always there, always present love. But you gotta, you gotta trust it. Yeah, and there's there and that Saint that Saint Paul. You have to have this is what what faith really means. You know the Greek the Greek word for faith in the New Testament is pistis, and that doesn't mean it better translated as trust, not rather as believing certain doctrines. It's trust. You have to let go and trust. And so this is it's a it's it's a form of prayer. And I don't know if you've done anything by way of centering prayer. Have tried any of, of, of centering prayer practice, very Christian practice. But it's the same thing. You work with a word, and then you just let the word go. Mm. You know? mm. Yeah, a little bit. You know, yeah, I've been on some uh, meditation retreats, Buddhist retreats. But, um, yeah, mostly kind of um, on my own, experimenting a little bit with centering prayer. Um, yeah. But I, I love what you said in your book where you say, God is not primarily a being that we know, but an activity that we feel when we allow that activity and energy to flow through us. Um, I think it's really getting at the point what you're I think what you're articulating is that for many Buddhists and um, and I think Christianity at its best, this isn't really about belief or doctrine or theology or concepts or ideas. But it's a more empirical thing that it's really experiential. Experiential, exactly. That it's um, it's about it's a, it's a it's a it's a path of the heart, and it's about experiencing God, um, not intellectually um, or conversationally as much um, as we might commonly think. I think that's probably why a lot of people, you know, they kind of turn to atheism and stuff like that, as they think. Yeah. Yes. You know, oh, I'm not I'm not having a conversation in my head with a being that's talking back to me. So, you know, it just seems very implausible and doesn't feel right. And, and I get that. I mean, I've I felt that myself. But sure. but what like you said, when um, there are moments that you feel something in your heart um, that, that seems to be um, uh, more fitting with this. Uh, I, a notion of God uh, that you can't quite put into words or ideas or concepts. Um, absolutely, it's interesting. And so I don't know. I just I just think of you know what are different objections that people might raise, right? Um, I mean, there's so many things of um, I, I don't I don't know if there's any that you'd be particularly interested in discussing. You know, there's the theodicy problem, right? The, uh, the issue of human suffering. And, um, you know, it's funny. I, I, I had a conversation recently with um, Peter Rollins. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He's a um, theologian and a philosopher by trade from Northern Ireland, I believe. And, um, and we were talking, and, and um, I'm, like I said, uh, very much in, in a way an advocate of 
uh, Buddhism and Alan Watts and, and all that. And, and one of the ways that Watts described, so, you know, in Rollins and I's discussion, he was saying he can't quite understand how things kicked off. And Buddhists usually don't get into um, the more philosophical, theological side of this, right? right. Um, but, of course, guys like Watts uh, and myself, even, we like to think about this. And he was saying yeah. within, within, within Hindu mythology that the universe is, is conceptualized as a kind of a dance or a play or a drama of God, that this is all... And, and that's, in a way, um, in my view, saying that there is no secondary purpose to creation, to life and experience and existence itself, that it is uh, it exists for its own sake. Um, but uh, as, as I was talking with Rollins, he kind of said he was having... Um, um, he objected to it philosophically and morally. I'm not sure if I can recall the philosophical objection, but the, the moral objection um, was that... Um, Okay, <laughs> the way he framed it, I don't know. It was like, okay, so there's, um, you have a bored God, right? Because I, what I use is, um, I use the way Alan Watts articulated. He said, he, he's, he's articulated in a few different ways, but one of the analogies that he used was that, imagine that every night you could dream any dream you wanted to dream, and um, 75 years of time. Well, over time, um, you would get on in the beginning you'd have all the pleasures you can imagine sex and food and living in mansions but then you'd introduce an element of danger and adventure and uncertainty and that would get uh you'd you'd gamble you know and take more further risks as time goes on until the point where you would dream the life that you're living now and even forgetting that you are actually dreaming which goes into the um Hindu and sometimes maybe Buddhists talk about the uh, illusion, Maya. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, it's kind of a sort of a beautiful conception. But I don't know if you had anything um, that if you would speak to that idea of whether, how, where do you stand on that in terms of, do you feel like that's a coherent or plausible way of um, what what God is actually doing? Right? What's and in the grand philosophical scheme of things, um, like I said, in this in this idea, Watts is saying, well, it's all a drama or a play of God, um, that we're all participating, a dance of God, right? Like Richard Rohr has that book, The Divine Dance. Um, yes. And, um, but then someone like Rollins, and I'm just thinking of those who might object and say, well, you know, the Holocaust, for example, how is that a play of god that god is just this oh god got bored and decided to give god self amnesia and uh experience this life which is so often at least 50 percent, if not more suffering right mm -hmm. what a horrible thought is another way of 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 coming at that does that make sense yeah yeah i think i think i see i um again there's all kinds of approaches you can take to this, but this this notion of um, of, of of reality of the world uh, of, of of existence as the dance of God mm -hmm. uh, that's a beautiful image, but it could also at least for me be a little bit misleading mm -hmm. as whatever happens, that's fine. you know that's God's dance. Don't worry, right. you know. So, you know. So the the now now we, we we're having the the coronavirus. It's going on. It's taking lives. But that's part of God's dance. It'll be it'll be finished in a, in, a, in, a, in a in a year or so. And yes, that's that for me is very. I, I think I would appreciate agree with, if I understood the objective of your friend of, of Roland. Of, Rollins, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, no, I mean. It means that again, and please, Winston, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to, you know, to give you this, uh, give an answer. But it seems sure. to me that yes, everything that is taking place is is rooted is is an expression of the ground of being, and so and so um, when you 
and 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 this the, the, all of reality you could divide it into um, just to make a distinction. You know, there is the, those aspects of of existence that have come to a form of awareness and consciousness, the animal level now, and then the human, where it's not just consciousness but free will and awareness, but that. Um, God is being God in human beings who, who, when they are not aware of who and what they are, namely the expressions of God, of God's life and God's love, when for whatever reason, and a lot of it is social conditioning, um, they're not aware of it, they're going to be, in many ways, so afraid and so insecure that they're going to do all kinds of things to make sure that they're going to survive and live on and, and protect themselves. And, um, and there's human evil. Mm -hmm. There is the Holocaust. There is, you know, the, some of the... The situations now where there's so such an, an, an inequality in the distribution of the goods of this world. So few who are wealthy and so many who can't feed their children. This this is human this is human choice um, and, and decisions. But it is an expression of God of, of God's very self. Um, in, but, but that's how it's expressed when people don't realize who they are. And on the natural level, things like the, the, the coronavirus, this is just the randomness and chance of the finite world. Hmm. You know, what physicists tell us that randomness sometimes sees things develop. Oftentimes they develop because of poor choices that human beings made. But sometimes, like earthquakes, volcanic ex explosions, they happen. Gosh. This understanding God as as the ground of being, God doesn't choose that or cause that. That happens. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine, and that means a friend of mine, Jim Finney, who is also kind of a mystical writer, a friend of Thomas Merton, student of Thomas Merton, said, "Understanding God as 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 this interconnecting spirit, not as a omniscient, all controlling." entity pulling the strings here and there um, it tells us that God protects us from nothing but is with us in everything mm, right. now protects us from the because things happen um, and human beings do awful things awful things and that's that don't blame it on God um, but what you can trust is that this source of life and love and strength is with you. And if nothing, if even in moments when you can't do anything, it's with you just to endure until you can. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think it, for me, on the theodicy question, it doesn't solve it, mm -hmm. but, but it, it just puts it in a different, in a different context. Um, yeah. Right, I think it's part of our nature probably to wrestle with these things that uh, we may oh. never resolve because, I mean, I, I just, you know, I, I think it's it's pretty apparent um, that we are interconnected and without question. And so I think that that implies a kind of unity. And um, it's beautiful that, that the way that that's expressed within the Buddhist tradition and in other ways... Um, it's just, yeah, it's just an, an ongoing question of, okay, so how does that fit with if, if um, we are all uh, part of this unity, this interconnected unity and um, in relationship with God, the light, like God is relational, we are relational, God is relationship itself. Um, yes. That, awesome. Right, that how, how does that all fit with... Um, why things are set up, right? Um, and of course, there are many possible answers to this, I suppose. But think, why, are they, why are they? Um, what it, why is the situation set up the way it is, oh. right? Mm -hmm. um, in, in which there is, it, it's almost as though suffering 
and you know violence and death and disease and all those things are almost built into it because even if you take human free will out of it i mean you look at the animal kingdom and, and the things that drive evolution um you know everything is in nature one way to look at it is that it's you know in competition with itself and you know the animals are hunting each other down and or eating as, as alan watts put it we all eat each other right exactly we all eat each other yes yeah you know it's built into the system right mm -hmm. and when a when a leopard is bringing down a gazelle and i don't want to minimize you know the what the gazelle is 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 feeling right but that's that's part of the interconnectedness too right. we give up ourselves and we 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 are not here just for ourselves, but at one at, in different points throughout our lives, when we fall in love, when we have a family, I don't have to tell you with three young children, <laughs> you have to give up a lot in order to give them life. Mm -hmm. That's 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 giving up yourself, and the ultimate act will be when you die, when you you give up yourself now for the ongoing course of life, um, and the animals just do it instinctively, and there's the there's the Nature, red in tooth and claw. What is it? That that that's the, the expression of the of the violence in in in, in yeah. nature. Right, because what you're touching on here, in a way, is kenosis. That the nature of love is this self emptying, and I think that at the at a certain level, that the divine, the self in all of us, the 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 connecting spirit in all of us. Um, somehow does that or participates in that that that's what it's all about is that um self-emptying nature of love uh the that we're getting out of ourselves and the gazelle in a way is doing that but except that the only difficulty there might be that the gazelle is not doing it willingly right, right. and and nor and nor is the leopard the leopard is just following instincts yeah that's, that's right. what it does uh-huh yeah but, uh, and, and but uh, what you say about kenosis and self emptying, and it's just the strangest thing that the best way, the best way to be selfish in terms of make ourselves happy, I want to make myself happy, is by emptying ourselves and making others happy. Mm. You know? I think that's an important point to make because, like you said, a lot of these ideas could potentially and, and in this age in which there is so much scapegoating and so much divisiveness and harmful beliefs and ways of looking at things we do have to be cautious and i think you point that out in your book you know at, in different places that we really need to be careful not to be too um i can't, can't think of the word but just too rigid with um rigid hanging to hanging her. on to beliefs whether yeah. they're buddhist or christian because right. like you said you could say, okay, well, the leopard is just doing its its own instinctual thing that is also the expression of God, and so therefore um, that gives me license to do any number of horrible things oh, I, as well, right? I'm not saying that you were saying that, but yeah, um, no, yeah right, but it can be interpreted that way, yes, exactly, yes. exactly. So, so I, I'm glad then that you are pointing out and saying. Um, I'm not. Hopefully, I'm not losing my train of thought here. But that, uh, oh, that um, that kenosis is showing us that um, that the way for us to be most fulfilled and happy, and and find joy, is not to be simply self. The best way, as you put it, to be selfish, is to be selfless. Uh, be selfless, <laughs> paradoxically. Right. But it's a profound paradox. Mm. You know, but which is which can be dangerous. You know, we, that, that doesn't mean we should all be groveling and and oh, don't nothing for me. No, we've got to take care of ourselves in order to be there for for others. But ultimately, ultimately, our final happiness will be to give ourselves over totally, mm. Mm -hmm. as it is in little ways when we do it with our friends, with our children, or just with the you know. The, the homeless person that just, I mean, even if we don't have any money to give them, just could, could look at him or her and say, hey, what's your name? And talk with them and connect with them. Mm. That little effort is, 
<laughs> that's what we are as human beings. If if it is this connecting spirit that that is God. Mm-hmm. What a paradox! What a paradox indeed. That uh, right. That that what makes us feel so much love and um, feel that we are fulfilling um, what it means for us to be human is to love. And by by definition, love is a kind of getting out of oneself. And it's always a love of something that is, um, you know, technically other, you could say. Yeah, yeah. You know, whether it's your children or your passion or a God, a God you know, it's... Um, but it's, where... Yeah, unity and diversity, right? Where Buddhists, however, have really pushed me on this, what you just said, to respond with love to others is, you know, their admonition that... Um, that means you have to respond to love even to the people who are threatening you, mm. whom you have to, whom you have to resist. Um, that was that that story in the in, in in the last chapter of my book. If you if we have time, I don't know where we're at here now. Sure, sure. Um, where when when I was my wife and I were very active in 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 working for human rights and peace. Um, in El Salvador during the during the years of um, of, a, of a civil war and when there were death squads, yes. death squads going around and and we, we we were traveling down to El Salvador once year. Anyway, I was on a Buddhist retreat before right before going to El Salvador when the death squad activity was at its height, and I it was with with Roshi Bernard Glassman, the who, who did died recently. Um, in, in, in New York. And I did my retreat and I went in for my dokusan, for my meeting with the, with the teacher. And I told him, I said, um, Roshi, I, I know I have to go down and try to do something to stop these death squads, especially because they were, many of them were being sponsored, financed at that time by the American government, not directly, but we were sending money down to the government and the government was using it to sponsor these death squads. Anyway, mm. I, I've got to do my do that. But I said, I also know I had to be here on this meditation. I had to sit. And I said, but I don't know why I had to do both of these two, two things. And he said, he looked at me, smiled, and he said, oh, you have to do both things. You've got to stop the death squads and you've got to sit <laughs> in meditation because and it was because you'll never stop the death squads unless you until you realize your oneness with them. Mm. You will never stop the death squads until you realize your oneness with them. And I'm still trying to unpack that. <laughs> I bet that sounds heavy. <laughs> but it means again, part of it is. You know, oneness with them. I'm a human being. Maybe if I were born in the circumstances that those that those those killers were born in, I'd be doing that to make a living. I don't know. Right. That's part of, but I think more profoundly, I'm not going to be able to stop them unless I love them. Mm. Unless I recognize their dignity, profound. Maybe their dignity just just covered over, uh, prevented from coming up because of the the. Of their of the, the where they the causes and conditions that the Buddha say, but that these are human beings in Christian language they are children of God, in Buddhist language they have Buddha nature, they have Buddha nature, but it's just they're not they're not in touch with it, and if I go after them out of hatred, then I'm just doing the same thing they're doing. Right. That that uh, right. It's it's as I said I think in the Dhammapada right the Buddhist text. Um, Hey, uh, hatred never ceases by hatred, but by love alone uh, can be. And then, then the last verse of that: This is an eternal law. This is an eternal law. Hatred is never overcome by hatred; it is overcome only by love. This is an eternal law. Right, right. And right. then, wait, go ahead. Yeah, no, just realizing that at root, um, even the death squads, it's like. Those are human beings um, at, at root who also just want to be loved, just want to avoid suffering, and um, and we have that in common with them. And 
if we can kind of get in touch with that um, and and speak to that part of them, right? That maybe exactly. that is a way forward. Yeah, and and of course, speaking to that, you said it beautifully. We have to speak to that part of them, mm-hmm. and that and the only language that can speak to that part of them, I mean, to really get to them, is to let them know that when I want to when I want to stop them from doing what they're doing, they have to know that I'm doing it, not because I think they're corrupt, bad, all wrong, but I'm doing it mainly because they can feel I'm loving them. I'm doing it because I care about them. Then, only then, I think, will there be the possibility of of a change in their heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the meantime, if they come after me, I gotta run. Yeah. (laughs) I'm not just out there putting out my neck. Oh, please, I love you. Do do whatever you want. No, this is... Uh, um, we have to be animated by, by compassion, but it can't be stupid compassion. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and um, yeah, in a way, all this seems uh, in some ways beyond our comprehension, and yet at the same time, it seems as though both Buddhists and Christians can come together and... Um, uh feel pretty pretty good about this common ground of compassion and love and uh seeing eye to eye on that um that uh yeah as much as we can't know about life and about god that that feels that feels right you know that that our path is the path of the heart heart, and that's definitely that's definitely what jesus taught yeah 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 Um, there's no doubt about that yes yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, with yeah. Easter around the corner, you know, it's like um, one of the quotes I really appreciated from your book is that um, where you talk about the resurrection, um, that the resurrection, uh, even though uh, it says that Christ is risen with a spiritual body and not tied to the body of Jesus necessarily, mm-hmm. the spirit is not disembodied. That Yes, it is yes. real in our bodies. To mm-hmm. celebrate Easter, as you say, is to believe, to feel, to affirm that Christ is alive in and as me, and as in, us. <laughs> in my body and in our bodies, in the mystical body of Christ, which we call, which we call the Church. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Alive. I mean, really, that's, that's, I mean, I don't know if that... If that is if that is not the case, if Christians aren't feeling the presence of Christ in them now, then you might say, if that's not what hap- what is happening, then it, what difference does it make that he rose, stepped out of the tomb? <laughs> if you'd step out of the tomb, I mean, it's a miracle, yeah. But what is the the heart of Easter? Is that he's alive in us, really alive in us, in it. Well, St. Paul said it best. Mm. It is no longer I who live. It is Christ doing the living in me. We, yeah. are, we are the continuation of Christ, right. you know, as, as I think Thich Nhat Hanh would put it, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. wonderful. Well, um, uh, this might be a good time to, for us to stop, although I, I, I hate to stop. I'd love to keep going forever. You know, uh, it's been a really fun conversation. No, no, thank you. Very enjoyable, Winston. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe, maybe one day we'll do it again. <laughs> yeah, if, if that might be the case, I would, I would, I would be happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so before we close, uh, is there anything you'd like to let audience n- members know about? Anything you're working on or where we can find more of you online or get in touch with you or find your book or anything like that? Well, I mean, I, don't, I, I really don't have a, um, you know, a website, and that's that, but, <laughs> but um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm available through Google. Just Google me and are on FaceTime, uh, uh, Facebook rather. Um, and um, be, be glad if people have questions. Um, um, I mean, I mean, my my. I don't know. Is it appropriate to give a an email address, or if people want to if you, connect? If you'd like, uh, you don't have to. It's up to. Uh, it's totally either. Uh, it's if totally there's fine. anybody listening that would want to follow up with questions, as much as my time allows, I'm available at Paul at paulnitter.com. Real easy. Just my name, Paul at 
P-A-U-L-K-N-I-T-T-E-R.com. Great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's been an honor to have you here at Second Table, Paul. And um, until next time, thank you so much again for yeah. joining us. This was a lot of fun. And thank you for all the good work you're doing, Vincent. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, Paul. Thank you.